<coughs> God's greatest musical gift is the human voice. And that must be what members of our early church felt because it seems that the music was mostly vocal. Uh, there were no organs in the early churches, at least not in the Presbyterian church. Surely there must have been a piano or a melodeon, which is sort of a pump organ, something to accompany singing. Whether there were big choirs or whether just con congregational singing, we don't know. But actually, this First Presbyterian did not get a pipe organ until 1859, when, as Buddy said, it was, the church was at, located on Capitol Street, 10th and Capitol. Uh, <clears throat> other churches, not Presbyterian, did have organs earlier. Um, Monumental got one in 1823, St. James in 1839, and St. Paul's in 1845. But by the time First Presbyterian decided that they felt the need to have a real pipe organ, and they ordered it from the Henry Urban Company in New York, by that time most churches felt the importance of a good pipe organ in leading the worship, and certainly in, in big churches like ours. Second Church got its organ two years later in 1861. Nathan Clapp had been called to serve as organist and probably choir director at the time of the arrival of that 1859 organ, and he served until his death in 1903. He was a Boston native who had graduated from the Leipzig Conservatory and had been considered the best American organ student to graduate from there. Now, there's a gap in the information I have between 1903 and 1910, but in 1910, J. Lamont Galbraith, a Scotsman with a degree from the Royal Academy of Music in London, came to be the organist choir director. As you can see, by this time, people in the church valued quality music, I'm sure, or they would not have hired these people who were so illustrious with their backgrounds. So under Mr. Galbraith's uh, leadership, in 1912, the Austin organ was installed. And I'll show you another picture of that uh, later. Now, what was done with that organ between 1940, when the church moved out here, and 1951, when it was installed in our present sanctuary, we don't know. Uh, our organist at the time was Mary Ann Gray, and she is still living in the West End. She's 97 years old. Some of you remember her. And I called her the other night to see if she knew what, what happened to it, whether it was just kept in the old church. I don't even know when the old church was uh, torn down. Does anybody know when the building was destroyed? So how it, long? In how the long? 50s, in 1950s. Oh, so it stayed. Well, maybe the organ was just sitting in this cold church. I can't imagine what that would have done to it. but. Anyway, either that or they dismantled it and put it in some building, but no, she didn't remember and no one knows. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, we moved in 1940 out here, as everyone has told you, and of course it was a small chapel, much bigger than the one we have now. You saw the pictures, and I want to go back to one of those pictures to show you where the choir, quote, the choir loft was. But I'm sure there was no money or even an inclination to, to buy a, a, a pipe organ, certainly. So we had a Hammond. And back in those days, I think the Hammond Company was probably the only company that was producing electronic organs. So we had that. Now, I was four years old in 1940, so I don't remember exactly <laughs> about that. But, and there's a picture that I have of the first, I suppose, choir director and the quartet uh, I don't remember them, but one of the ladies in that quartet looks to be Lydia Furl, whom some of you remember, and she was the first elder they were talking about that was elected. Uh, when you see the picture, you might like to check me on that. But later in the 40s, I do well remember Ruth Chesson, whose family was a member of this church. They were very active here, and we had a paid professional quartet. I remember well, they were excellent. And one of those, <coughs> excuse me, one of those members was, one of those choir members was a member of our church. And she was the contralto, and she, her name was Ellen Swain. And the other three, now I don't even have to look at notes. I just remember how good they were and how many years I enjoyed them. So I remember 
The soprano was Lee Meredith, the tenor was George Wesley Jones, and the baritone was Brantley Watson. And they did, they sang beautifully and wonderful quality music. So that's all we had, except for a lot of congregational singing. One interesting uh, item I think you'll appreciate is, legend has it, someone told me this, and I hope she was right on it, I don't remember, but uh, during World War II, every Sunday, the congregation sang Eternal Father, Strong to Save, as long as we had people serving abroad. <clears throat> now, after our present sanctuary was built in 1951, Mary Ann Gray came on as our first real minister of music and she had degrees from the University of Michigan and a Union Theological Seminary in New York. She worked patiently and tirelessly around and with the tired, old, wheezing Austin organ. It was always a trial, but she made it sound good. She was very talented. She made it sound good. She established the chancel choir and the children's choirs, uh, and I think I know my picture's in there, Susan Mountcastle, you'll see that. Susan Mountcastle is standing in the front row, and Gordon Harrison, and Jay Johnston tells me he was probably in there too, so we'll have to look. We were you know, little, little people at that time. And we did lovely anthems every Sunday, but we also did major choral works of the faith, such as the uh, Verdi and Brahms and Foray and Mozart and Requiems and uh, Mendelssohn's Elijah and St. Paul and Hamill's Messiah uh, and others. So um, she worked many years. She was with us until from, from 1951 to 1985. And she worked with many committees to try to get a, the, you know, studies, the feasibility of purchasing <coughs> a badly needed organ. And it's a shame that this dream did not come to fruition during her tenure here. <laughs>